Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matthias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of our show. Today, we are talking to Vanessa Terzian, who is a, an attorney, practices in the area of estate planning and probate. Vanessa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I am so excited to have you on the show. We've spoken together on several occasions. We, we are in a networking group together. We know each other. And to have you on the show, I'm so happy to have you. Just, just letting you know. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to talk about, the, the topic for today is mistakes in estate planning. Now, in your career as a corporate trustee, and then as a, you know, you had your own firm, and then you, mer- you join another firm, and then you merge into a, into a powerhouse, of which you are a partner at, you must have seen a lot of them, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I can, how, long, how much time do we have today? If you go on for right. a while. So let's talk about the most common. What are the most common ones that you've seen in your career? This issue probably is is more of an issue as opposed to a mistake, but I would say the most common mistake or issue is not giving enough consideration to who you choose as your trustee, your successor trustee. This would be the person who would step in as the administrator of the estate if something happened to the person who set it up. And the corporate trustee, often they've brought in a third party trustee, obviously, to settle up the estate. But a a common mistake, if you will, was naming an individual co-trustee. So now we have two trustees, Uh, two cooks in the kitchen, and not really considering how those trustees might work together. Mm -hmm. Uh, As a corporate trustee, I, I... this will kind of sound maybe odd, but I always felt like the individual trustee was sort of dead weight. You know, I was moving things forward and I'm kind of waiting on this person to respond. So I think a lot of times people don't give enough thought to who they're naming in that key role and maybe considering a third party. Believe me, I know there are pros and cons to corporate trustees, Mm -hmm. there are pros and cons to individuals, but please be wary. I would say, please be wary of the idea of having two trustees act so that, you know, ultimately, we run into deadlocks when it relates to those kinds of situations. And I'm sure you've seen it where you have yeah. a trust listing and someone says, I think this should be this price. And I think it should be that price. And there, we literally have inertia. Nothing moves forward. So people think oftentimes it's the best idea to have two heads better than one or a check and balance power, but often it leads to just deadlock and nothing progresses forward. I was just I was just going to say that check and balance thing. When you are doing the estate plan, you're assuming, you know, the more people I get involved, the better the assets are going to be protected. And in the end, when the time comes, you just want somebody who's very competent. So you don't have... Very competent, good communication skills, fair. And you want a primary point person as a, a, instead of a committee. And there are other ways to incorporate check and balance and the idea of a trust advisor, a trust protector Mm -hmm. that could come in if there was a major issue. But honestly, on day-to-day decisions a trustee has to make in order to settle the estate, just need to be able to move it forward. Yes. And and I I I, I just said an episode on independent review of estate planning. So that can be something that somebody can also do if they have, um, you know, issues of thinking like, oh, maybe I'm going to make some, there is a mistake here, there's a mistake there, so that you can kind of like sleep at night and feel comfortable that everything is is going well. You have seen, we've talked briefly about, you know, the, I guess there are three three primary types of, of, of you know, we have a, a corporate trustee, somebody can have a professional fiduciary, or the example that we see in most cases is a family member, an adult child that you know is the oldest child that becomes that becomes the 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 trustee. Do you, have you noticed in in these categories? Have you noticed which one is preferred and and how do they change based on the situation? You know, it really does vary client to client, family to family. I would uh-huh. say it still is most common to name a family member, and right. that often works out really well if there isn't conflict amongst the different family members. Right. Uh, and again, you get someone who's very fair, balanced, mm-hmm. probably the number one 
thing I'd like them to be good at is, is communication. Yeah. Um, but I'm noticing a trend in, in the estate plans that I'm working on with families to consider a third party trustee, whether right. it's an individual or a small corporate trustee or a very large one. Mm -hmm. And I think there is benefits to that in the sense that you have an independent third party really doesn't have skin in the game. So they're going to right. be, they're not gonna have a conflict of interest. At least having that discussion with your estate planning attorney to see if maybe it's the right fit, or maybe they are a successor trustee. You know, maybe you have the individual listed, but if that's really too hard for that person to take on that role, you have a third party as a backup. Or finally, there's kind of an interim ground where you can have a family member be the trustee, but a corporate trustee be a agent for them and really do all of the back office work that the individual normally would have to do that, frankly, is a full-time job and they have their right. own right. Yeah. It really depends on those certain circumstances, but it's worth considering the different options at the very least and having that discussion with your estate plan before you just automatically assume <clears throat> my oldest son has to be the trustee. It just may not be the right fit. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, what are some of the things that you've seen in your experience that you feel that have led to litigation in the drafting of a trust? I think when things are too complicated, okay. I think when we as drafters imagine something looks really good on paper, but then in practice is very hard to administer. Right. I'll give you a quick example. As a corporate trustee, I was the, I kind of helped to oversee a, a about a, it was about a million dollars in this educational pot trust. Okay. That meant all the grandkids, and there were quite a few, could pull from this one common pot of money or pool of money to be uh, to go to school. But mm -hmm. there wasn't really any good precedent set on how much they could pull. What right. is is it for living expenses and um, or just books or just tuition? And right. there hadn't been kind of clear, concise language or mm -hmm. even a letter of intent from the grand tour saying, this is what my thinking of is. And so what happened was the oldest grandchildren were pulling at such a rate. They were on their fifth year of college. They were living in condos near the beach. You know? right. So they were really milking this trust. There was no way that there was going to be anything left for the next generation. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had to reset the precedent and be very lean with what, what the trust which provides so we could stretch it farther. But the concept was good, right? The idea of, yes, of course. full of money was great, but the execution wasn't ideal. Very good. Very good. Well, very bad for them, but very good that somebody stepped in and, and, and was I able to. What it came down to, the, the oldest grandkids were not very happy with me, but we had to restructure the expectations so we could have a successful administration for future generations. That makes total sense. Now, what, what other mistakes have you noticed in estate planning that, that are glaring and, and, and come up often in your practice? You know, again, it's, it's more about thinking about things practically. So you do mm -hmm. deal with real estate quite a bit, obviously. That's your yes. Oftentimes someone will think, okay, well, I have a family member, a partner, a friend who lives with me now. If I pass away, I want to give them the right to continue to live in this house. Right, right. Um, and it's often ca called a life estate or a right mm -hmm. to reside. But in theory, sounds great because you want to make sure you take care of your partner or loved one that's been living with you for a long time. Yes. But it completely makes the real estate asset unmarketable, unsellable, unproductive. Mm -hmm. And then there's not enough thought given to the practical nature of, well, then who's paying the expenses? Where's the money coming from if the roof falls in? And so years later, we get to a point where, you know, this, this asset is draining the funds of the trust or there's not enough funds to support someone continuing to live there. And it's hard to obviously have those discussions with that individual who's made this their home. So again, kind of not thinking through the practical nature of giving someone the right to live there for their, for their life without any understanding of how things are paid for how funds are covered uh, expenses wise. That makes sense. Now, something else that, that um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about is the fact that sometimes people don't discuss their plans with their family. And how do you, um, you know, sort of help people understand the importance of, you know, you know what you want to do and no one else in your family does. And, you know, um, right. that's not necessarily a good thing. 
Um, well, it's, it's the traditional approach, right? The traditional approach is you'll get it when I'm dead. So what's the point in talking about it now? Or I don't want my kids right. to know how much money I have. And the reality is they probably already do know how much. My kids today are very savvy. They can right. see low the, 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 the value of real estate. You know, I had a, a child say, well, I saw your statement on the desk one day. I mean, they know these things. So if we're not right. talking about it, they're piecing the information together on their own. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you asked about, you know, issues that lead to litigation, it's usually lack of communication and what what I always say, surprises. No one yes. likes surprises. So no one wants to find out that once you pass away, it's not a family member. You're not the trustee, a, a corporate trustee is. Um, yes. Or you don't get this money outright. You get it over time because we want to protect and preserve the assets. And so I tell people, if we want to have this plan be successful, because that estate plans are just that, they're a plan, they're words written on a piece of paper collecting dust until someone does pass away. Yes. We have this plan when it's implemented, when the rubber really hits the road to be successful, we have to prepare the key role players like the trustee, like the beneficiaries or heirs for what is next. How is this plan going to be implemented? If we don't, it's very highly, it's highly likely this panel, plan will fail. And even statistically, that's true. 70% of estate plans fail. Wow. Okay. So the transition doesn't occur past more than one or two generations. Family wealth is lost due to litigation issues that come up. So if we don't want to be part of that statistic, then we have to consider ways to prevent that, like discussing the plan ahead of time. Which there are ways to do it that don't make someone feel uncomfortable. Your estate planner can lead that discussion or other trusted advisors put the kind of onus on them to lead that uh, discussion with the family members, but to participate in it so you can ensure your heirs are prepared for that transition. I love what you said. And I, I always say that nobody likes surprises. People don't mind bad news, but they don't like surprises. It's like you have to just let people know. And the example you made is really on point on making people feel like if you name somebody else as a trustee of your trust and, and your kids don't know about it and then do pass away and they're like, oh, by the way, none of you are the trustee. Um, my son-in-law is the trustee or whatever the person that's named, that's bound to make people feel a little like unpleasant to say the least. Yeah, it's human nature. We always, uh, I think it's easy when we don't know what's happening when things are unknown to assume the worst. Yeah. So that's why when I go back to communication of the trustee, if you find yourself as a trustee, you want to over communicate because that releases your liability. You said, I told you, I yes. told you, you're saying you didn't say anything at that point. You can't come back a year later and tell me, well, where's this, where's that? Yeah. So it's, it's a liability issue, but it's also ensuring that there are no surprises, you know, and, and again, if someone doesn't know what's happening, it's human nature to assume the worst. Very, that makes total sense. Let's talk uh, briefly about um, the mistake of in uh, naming guardians for minor children. Um, what What is your advice for somebody who's considering to name, you know, I want to name a guardian in my trust, in my estate planning, but I really don't know who I should that's name. A great question. And that's also a really hard one. It's, it's as important as who's going to be the trustee or in charge of the money. And it may or may not be the same person, you know, right. it's it may, or you might want to divide up the task. You kind of want to pick the right person for the role and everyone's not good at everything, right? So the guardian, you want to look at some practical things like perhaps location and it's okay. I mean, you have family overseas, right? You can yes. name that family overseas, but then you need a temporary guardian or first yes. responder because there's going to be a lag time between that family arriving and perhaps an emergency situation coming up. Right. Uh, ideally, at some point, you again want to communicate or let these people know that they're in this key role. Maybe mm -hmm. you don't go into like an order of priority or details on who got mm -hmm. picked versus who is the secondary or backup. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, when people name uh, a guardian, they're thinking of that um, married couple, like you know, two people who are a couple that would serve in that role, which is perfect. Most people, most people kind of imagine perhaps you know a couple environment. Uh, yes. for if they weren't there, but then you need to address if they're not together anymore, 
uh, would you want it to go to the next couple or would you want which of the two is now going to be the guardian? Because it's, it's impossible for usually a divorce couple, not a good idea for a divorce couple to be that. So you want to think of um, the alternatives if you are naming more than one person or a couple in that, in that role. That makes total sense. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, let's talk about your involvement with the Institute for Preparing Hairs and a book that you've that you've co-written, which is Executors, Trustees, and Beneficiaries. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about what is the Institute for Preparing Hairs? It's a great resource, um, and you can view the resources online. It's a local institute uh, started by a few thought leaders, including the co-author of, of the book I wrote, uh, Vic Chrysler, mm -hmm. and and uh, they have developed a lot of tools to help family ensure they're not part of that 70% of the wealth transition failing. They mm -hmm. do educational events that I participated in, created a lot of checklists and I like checklists. I'm a checklist person. So yes. how to start the conversation with your family or key things you'll want in your estate plan, uh, what to look for in a trustee, uh, so these types of resources for families who are um, thinking about ahead of time transitioning wealth and again, mm -hmm. ensuring that that transition doesn't fail. And the book was a great one because I thought, OK, if and it's kind of just pick it up, read one or two pages and you get mm -hmm. a like nugget or a kernel or thought, you know, that you can take if you find yourself in the hard and difficult role of being trustee. And understanding how the role of trustee interplays with the beneficiary and often the trustee is also a beneficiary right right if they're the son or the daughter or the grand or a trust or a son of the trust so these tools are really meant just to help families or individuals to, to think about their estate plan a little bit differently to ensure that those different transitions are successful with utilizing the different checklists and tools that they've developed so it's a lot of fun and i encourage people to take that and look at it as a resource it's, it's helpful Wonderful. I just signed up for their newsletter and I encourage everybody to to do the same. Uh, let's let's talk about let's talk about you now. Let's talk about your journey to where you are today, which being a rock star in, in what in your field, you know, I, I don't mean to flatter you, but but you you've had a um tell me how it all started. I mean, did you plan on when you went to law school? Were you like, okay, you know, I'm gonna focus on estate planning. That's gonna be Absolutely my thing. not. I have okay. never <laughs> Do I actually, um, most people kind of worked for a little bit and then go back to law school. I graduated a little early from undergrad, went directly, probably looking back, would have done that because law school was really hard. <laughs> and uh, I think when you have a little bit more life experience under your belt, you put those kind of challenges in perspective. But it was sort of like, okay, business school or law school, pick one. Okay, law school. I did well on the LSAT. Great. I'll get in somewhere and go. Uh, <laughs> I met my husband in law school, so I'm glad I went there. there you go. And um, he's an attorney in the trust and estates world as well, too, and focuses on litigation. But neither of us knew that this is what we want to do. It, I got lucky kind of connecting with or getting kind of recruited by the trust department at Wells Fargo to work in the risk management and trust administration field, and I fell in love with it. It right. was Every day was a new day with something interesting. It's right. never a dull moment. You know, working with families and different yes. situations that all the personalities that kind of come together during difficult times, like someone passing away or someone being sick, really makes a difference with who the support team around them right. guiding through that process. So I loved the importance of the communication and hand-holding, but also the legal tech, technical side and the tax side. So it was really the perfect marriage of those two kind of key things for me. Um, and I tell people, I just got really lucky finding myself in that um, job and then kept the rest is history. That's wonderful. Very, very nice. Okay. Let's, uh, before we wrap up, there is something I love to do, which is I have a list of 30 questions. They are numbered one <laughs> through 30. And I want you to pick a number at random and I will ask you that question. Okay, so any, pick a number, any number. Okay, we'll do four. Four, okay. All right, that's a good question. What are you passionate about? Oh my goodness, it is a great question. Well, you guys can see from, from our discussion that I, I love what I do. I'm really passionate about it, but I also really love to read. I just sort of nice. hate books. Um, I kind of speed read through it. And then I fill in the blanks with my imagination 
And when I'm not, and this is rare, when I'm not kind of inhaling a different book on my Kindle or paper, I just go through all different genres. I love fantasy, sci-fi, I love um, period pieces, everything. Then I'm going to take those different concepts and write short poems or short stories. Oh, um, nice. The only time, this is really embarrassing, I'm share it. The only real time that I can write those poems or thoughts is when I'm in the bath. <laughs> That's I'm gonna, great. You know what? I'm going to close the door, light my candle, sit in the bath and read or write something. And it's a lot of fun. So I'm passionate about that too. I just wish I had more time to do it. That is wonderful. And you know what? Taking time for yourself is really, really important. It's something it's I tell my wife all the time. Yeah, like You got to do it. really hard. And we tend to put in the service industry, right? As professionals, we put our clients and everyone else first. And we got to take a step back and definitely take some, some me time for sure. Very, very true. Now, I'm not going to let you get away with talking about the fact that you love reading without giving us some titles. Okay. What are you reading now? Or what? Tell us something, some books you really like. Doesn't have to be you know something what? you're reading um, right now. If you guys haven't watched, um, is it, I, and I'm totally going to butcher the name. Um, I think it's Daisy and the Six. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, now, a Netflix, it's now uh, I think, uh, on Amazon. And yes. that author has written several, several books, and I love all of her books. But Dave, Daisy Jones and the Six. Really fun read, easy read, and the music in the um, in the show is great. So read the book first, okay, then watch the show. It follows the show really, really well. I also was a Game of Thrones freak, so I read all of the books. First, oh, okay, and then watched the series, which the first season completely followed the books, and then it kind of went off from there. But you always have to read read, read the book first, and then watch the series. And um, I recommend that one; it would be great. That is wonderful. Okay, one last thing before I let you go. Obviously, I want people that are looking for a tr for a trusted advisor to be able to reach you. In the show notes, we're going to have your contact info, your firm's contact info. But for people that are listening to this on Spotify or on Apple Podcast, uh, what is the best way to reach you? Email is good because I check that I'm like one of those weird people that have to zero out their inbox for the most part or the next morning, you know, clear it out before the new day. Um, uh -huh. So email at vtarzan at laborloft.com. Um, Perfect. It's a really easy way to get a hold of me and then we can coordinate for the best thing to get a hop on a Zoom call, chat over the phone, come in. I'm in the office, you can see all, all every day, uh, all the time. Um, I love coming in in person and, and most of my clients actually do, we do meet in person still, but Zoom is great. Uh, but email, the initiate conversations is the best place to start for sure. Wonderful, wonderful. Vanessa, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure well, to have you. Great show. Um, I love all the content I've been following and watching. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will see you on the next episode. Bye.